the reason the focus is on best management practices is because at the end of the day, we're producing food, right? On a daily basis, uh, farmers are producing food, they're harvesting food, and we want to make sure that it's as, as clean as and, and as safe as possible. And so these practices are really about maintaining sort of a, a constant procedure that uh, minimizes the risk of contamination, whether that's you know, organic material like bacteria or, or anything of, of that nature, um, and that there's a, a, a very consistent and, and logical process to follow to harvest uh, food as, as safely and as efficiently as possible. There is a dairy code and every province has a, a, a dairy code and that's really based on um, the handling of, of the milk and the storage of milk and, and then the movement of milk afterwards. But most of the recommendations actually for these uh, best practices for milk harvest are based on um, the best scientific evidence that we have. So they're evidence-based and, and it's really trying to understand what's in the literature, what people have evaluated, uh, what research has been done to understand which practices are the most effective at uh, reducing mastitis and uh, improving milk quality. So when we talk about best practice for milk harvest, it starts with clean cows, as clean as possible, coming in. Um, and then before we attach the milking unit, we want to make sure that the udder and particularly the teats are as clean as possible because during milking, as milk is harvested, it's the entire teat that comes into contact with that milk as, as the, uh, the milk leaves the, uh, the mammary gland and ultimately ends up in, in the bulk tank. Utter wash is anything that we use sort of as a first step to do the gross decontamination, right? Remove any dirt and so on. So similar to what we would do with washing our hands. Teat dips are of two types. Um, some are used before milkings. We most commonly use them and, and consistently use them after milking. Um, most of our teat dips are iodine based. Some are chlorhexidine as well. And what they're meant to do is they're actually meant to, to kill bacteria. Wiping is something that we do for two reasons, again. One is to remove contamination and remove any residual teat dip before milking, but it's also part of the process for stimulating milk letdown for the cow. So utter wash is, is really generally a product that has some kind of a, a soap or, or some kind of a, a characteristic. Some, some have even some emollients in them and so on. So it's, it's actually for that gross decontamination, if, if you will. And disinfectants are actually designed to kill all bacteria on, on whatever surface. And so we think of, um, you know, right now during COVID-19, we're doing a lot of disinfection right, and, and trying to wipe down surfaces and kill all vir viruses and bacteria. Sanitizing is sort of a little step down where we try to reduce the bacterial or the contaminant load, but it isn't necessarily killing all of the bacteria or viruses. So it's sort of a, a step in between. The misconception I think that's out there is that it's really protecting the teat end from the milker's hands, right? That People worried at some point, and, and there is some evidence to support a bit of this, that people can, you know, with hands getting cracked and dry, you can get staph aureus infections, for instance, and on your hands, and they worry, you know, some people worry about spreading that to the cows. That actually happens quite infrequently. It's really about the making it easier for the milker to clean hands between cows. And so if you've got the gloves, you want to wash also between, you want to wash your hands or the gloved hands between um, between cows. Recently, so we've been looking at some of the barriers to adoption and things like, like best practices. So I made the mistake of standing up at a meeting, uh, a research group meeting, oh, probably about 10 years ago, and I said, you know, we don't need to spend another penny on research of, of how to prevent mastitis. What we need to do is to figure out why people aren't doing the things that we know that, that work. And so that led us down a bit of this journey about trying to understand what, what producers are doing and, and why they're doing what they are or not doing what they should do. And we've done this through questionnaires. We've done this through focus groups with, with dairy producers in different parts of the country and so on. And one of the things that, that we've come to understand is that um, because milking happens so consistently, 
you know, two or three times a day on every farm, um, people definitely get into habits and best practices and milking routine is, is, is a habit and should be done consistently, which is a good thing. Um, if they're, you know, whoever has taught the current milkers what to do, if they haven't included all of the steps, then the current milkers don't necessarily include all of the steps. And their philosophy basically is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. In other words, you know, if the milk quality is good, their mastitis rate is low, why should they be doing anything else? It seems that what they're doing is working, and, and, and that's fair enough. Um, what usually generates change is when we see all of a sudden, if, if the cell count starts to go up, for instance, or the bacteria starts to go up, or mastitis, either subclinical or clinical, starts to go up, then people start to look at, well, what are we doing? And one of the areas that they focus on is, is milking practices and milking time visits. And so things change. But by and large, you know, we found that, um, that there isn't a lot of, um, a lot of motivation to, uh, to, to change. And, and a, to a certain extent, that's a good thing. Certainly, there's always room for, for improvement. But I think as, as an industry, we should be pretty proud of the quality of the milk that we, that, uh, that we produce on a day-to-day -day basis.